on World News Tonight. Deadly flooding. Several thousands fear dead as catastrophic floods hit Libya. Morocco quake. Morocco deals with the aftermath of the deadly earthquake as death tolls continue to rise. En route. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un crosses the border into Russia ahead of highly anticipated meetings with Putin. And elusive escape. Luxury designer Michael Kors conducts his Summer 24 collection in Brooklyn. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are joining us on World News. We begin tonight as tensions escalate along the Afghan-Pakistan border. Pakistan has accused Afghanistan's Taliban government of constructing unlawful structures at a key border crossing, calling it a violation of territorial sovereignty. The Tarkan border crossing in Pakistan's northwestern province has been closed after a deadly exchange of fire. Hundreds of trucks carrying essential goods have since been stranded on both sides of the border. The Taliban government accused the Pakistani security forces of firing on its troops when they were repairing an old security post. It said Islamabad was causing hindrances and delays in opening the transit point. Whereas Pakistan has alleged the Afghan forces were illegally building a new border post, which led to the exchange of fire between the guards. The Taliban said two of its guards were killed in the firing. The talk on border closure came as relations between the two countries remain frosty, with Pakistan repeatedly urging Afghanistan to control the movement of armed attackers and stop them from entering its territory. Afghanistan denies the allegation that it allows its soil to be used by armed groups to launch attacks on other nations. Pakistan's allegations follow a surge in armed attacks in Khyber Pankhurtwa and Balkistan provinces since the Taliban came to power in 2021. Most such attacks are claimed by the outlawed Pakistan Taliban, also known by the acronym TTP, which is ideologically aligned with the Taliban in Afghanistan. On the day of the talk of firing, TTP claimed to have attacked two military checkpoints in remote Kitra district, killing four Pakistani soldiers. At least 12 TTP fighters also died in the attacks. Severe weather sweeped Libya as Libyan authorities stated that at least 2,000 people were killed and thousands more were missing after a massive flood ripped through the city of Derna following a heavy storm and rain. Authorities in eastern Libya say thousands of people are dead after a massive flood tore through the city of Derna, with thousands more feared missing. Storm Daniel swept in over the Mediterranean on Sunday after pummeling Greece last week. One official said dams above Derna collapsed, sweeping away whole neighborhoods. The disaster took place in a part of the country that the internationally recognized government in Tripoli does not control. Still, the council in Tripoli, which serves as head of state in the divided country, has called for international help. Turkey, for one, said it's sending three planes to transport rescuers and humanitarian aid. Earlier on Monday, the head of the Red Crescent aid group in the region said the death toll was expected to hit 250. Could not immediately verify either estimate. Authorities from the interim government in Tripoli and in the east have both declared three days of mourning. Grim updates from Morocco now. The death toll from the deadly earthquake in Morocco has risen to over 2,800. And authorities have stated that rising death tolls are to be expected in the coming days. In what was the strongest earthquake to hit the center of Morocco in over a century, the death toll from Friday's deadly quake has now risen past 2,800. According to the local authorities, as of Monday, 2,862 were killed and 2,562 others injured in the 6.8 magnitude earthquake. The worst affected area is the province of Al Haouz, where nearly 1,500 people have died due to the fact that it's located at the foot of the Atlas Mountains and includes remote villages and settlements that have been challenging for rescuers to reach. And with the golden time ticking down and rescuers struggling to get to the victims, there are fears the death toll could rise even further over the next several days. And with so many hard-to-reach areas, authorities have not yet issued any estimates for the number of people missing. UNICEF also estimates that about 100,000 children in the country may be affected by the earthquake. 
while the UN Children's Agency says it doesn't know exactly how many children were killed or injured in the disaster. 2022 estimates show that children make up around one-third of the population of the North African nation. Meanwhile, Seoul's foreign ministry announced Monday that it's ready to support Morocco if the country makes such a request. However, the official who spoke on the condition of anonymity said the government has not reached a mutually agreed-upon aid plan with Morocco just yet, but will decide on support measures after consulting with Moroccan authorities. The South Korean government also vowed to work in close consultation with both Morocco and the international community to help the country overcome any difficulties. The migrant crisis worsens in the U.S. as a surge of asylum seekers in New York City has put pressure on the city's shelters. Migrants now make up more than 50 percent of the city's population. The influx has compounded problems for New York City, which hasn't faced such levels of homelessness since the 1930s. New York City is facing a level of homelessness not seen since the Great Depression in the 1930s. That's according to the Coalition for the Homeless, a not-for-profit. As of mid-August, there were more than 110,000 people sleeping in the city's shelter system each night. And that number doesn't include the thousands of unsheltered people who sleep on the streets. Compounding the chronic problem is an influx of asylum seekers, who now make up more than half the sheltered population. Juan De La Cruz at the Coalition for the Homeless sees the impact firsthand. Um, for example, here at St. Bartholomew's Church, where we start serving, we were seeing on average anywhere from 250 to 275 people, more or less regularly. Um, once the new arrivals started coming, our numbers got up over 400 people. It's not gone unnoticed by the city's unsheltered population. Although I have to wait no for all these channels, and they're picking up busloads of people from other places and giving them space. Why can't we get first dibs? New York State has been bound by a decades-old consent decree from a class action lawsuit to provide shelter to people without homes. That mandate has become a point of contention between the city and the state. Now we're getting people from all over the globe. Mayor Eric Adams says the city is running out of money, space and personnel to care for asylum seekers. I don't see an ending to this. This issue will destroy New York City destroy New York City. We're getting 10,000 migrants a month. And everyone is saying it's New York City's problem. Adams has called for more support, including a way to expedite pathways to work authorization for asylum seekers. A barrier that surprises some new arrivals, says Jeffrey Newman, founder of Backpacks for the Street, a nonprofit. And I think that we don't have, there's, there's no infrastructure here to allow people to figure out what, how they move through that process and what that process is. Um, and the same thing for the people who are, who are homeless already and existing here. Uh, there is no sort of, it's a broken system. And where Mayor Adams sees no end in sight to the migrant influx, Philip Yanos from John Jay College at the City University of New York isn't so sure. He separates the more recent problem around new arrivals from the chronic issue of homelessness. I think that the, uh, the crisis around asylum seekers will pass. Um, and of course, there are federal responses that need to be um, made. And um, I, I don't think this is going to stay on like this. But the issue of chronic homelessness among single adults and families will continue in New York City. Um, as, as it continues to become less and less affordable. Tonight, vote to the White House now. Donald Trump crossed paths with several Republican rivals as he attended Iowa's in-state college football grudge match, one of the former president's few visits so far to the state that holds the first nominating caucus next year. Trump waded into one of the state's largest sports crowds at Jack Trice Stadium in Ames, where Iowa State was hosting Iowa. Also at the game were Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and several lesser-known candidates. With the race entering its traditional ramp-up after Labor Day, Trump has largely skipped holding town halls or participating in many of the state's cherished campaign traditions. 
but has not paid a price so far. Trump remains far ahead of DeSantis and other rivals in Iowa and nationally. Trump has made a habit of visiting Iowa on the same day as DeSantis, who Trump treats as his main threat. Both were in and around the stadium before kickoff, reminiscent of the scene where Trump drew huge crowds to the Iowa State Fair in Des Moines, while DeSantis addressed smaller audiences and hit the midway ride with his family. Furthermore, Trump stopped at a fraternity house before the game and came outside to greet cheering students. At one point, he stood in front of a table with a line of footballs arranged between red plastic cups. He picked up each of the balls and threw them into the crowd, amusing spectators. Welcome back. Kim Jong-un's heavily armored private train has crossed into Russia, ahead of an expected and closely watched summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin amid warnings from the United States that the two leaders could strike an arms deal. Russia desperately requires fresh supplies of ammunition and shells after more than 18 months of war in Ukraine has left its military battered. While North Korea, which has faced years of international sanctions over its nuclear weapons program, is short of everything from hard cash and food to missile technology. The meeting could lead to Pyongyang getting its hands on the sort of weapons two decades worth of United Nations sanctions have barred it from accessing, especially for its nuclear-capable ballistic missile program. The U.S. government said that arms negotiations between Russia and North Korea are actively advancing and further talks could take place as part of Russia's efforts to find new suppliers for weapons to use in its war against Ukraine. After years of uncertainty relating to Brexit, Britain's auto industry received a new boost when BMW announced it would invest £600 million at its UK plants to convert its iconic mini brand to all electric by 2030. BMW will invest £750 million at its UK plants to take its iconic mini brand all electric by 2030. That was the announcement from the German car maker Monday. BMW will make two electric models at the Mini plant in Oxford in central England from 2026. Those models are the Mini Cooper 3 door and the compact crossover Mini Aceman. But from the start of the next decade, the facility will make only electric models. The same two models will also be made in China and exports of those cars will begin in 2024. It's a boost for Britain's car industry after years of Brexit-related uncertainty. BMW said the UK government had provided support for the investment but did not provide details. The carmaker will also invest in its UK plant in English town Swindon which makes parts for Mini models. The Mini has proven popular ever since the brand was revived just after the turn of the century. Its future in Britain has been uncertain for years. The auto industry is still concerned about upcoming new rules. British and European car makers are calling for a delay in the implementation of post-Brexit rules of origin. Under those terms, 45% of the value of an EV being sold in the EU must come from Britain or the EU from next year to avoid tariffs. And now we have some good news for you. A group of Nigerian students have emerged victorious in the annual Kids Innovation Challenge hosted by the Destiny Trust. The team, all students at a local technical college, built a smart compost system capable of transforming food waste into manure. This team of students have won Nigeria's annual Kids Innovation Challenge. They built a smart compost system capable of transforming food waste into manure. As Nigeria grapples with significant food shortages, the team believes their innovation could have profound implications, enabling farmers to convert waste into manure efficiently. Our project is an Arduino-based smart compost system. It was fabricated with a grinding and a mixing machine. Hosted by the Destiny Trust, the annual Kids Innovation Challenge teaches coding and robotics to children. It aims to contribute to Nigeria's tech sector by fostering a space for innovative ideas to flourish. Abimbola Ojenike is the co-founder of the Destiny Trust. We have many tech talents that Africa can take advantage of. And our own work is to go and identify them, train them, and put them back into the economy. Since its inception in 2018, the Kids Innovation Hub has trained about 676 children. This year's challenge saw a wide range of entries, including a baby watch system, 
and a platform to assist farmers in moving produce from their farms to customers. Uchendo David is part of the winning team. What this project does is that it gets organic waste like our foods, our wasted foods, grass, spoitium, all sort of wasted foods, depending on the type. And then it can be able to turn this, this wasted food into compost manure. It can be able to turn it by itself automated. So you have to just put in little or no effort in monitoring it. The winning team received a prize of 200,000 Naira, that's about $266, and an HP laptop. Oluyemi Sopade is in the winning team. This is an encouragement for us as Kingdom Tech. I will work towards more projects because of this amazing, like we are, we are, we are happy about it. In other news, the recent Mexico Supreme Court ruling which promises to expand abortion access seemingly will not become a reality overnight. The expansion of abortion access will depend on the political and legislative will of the federal government. Abortion rights advocates were handed a huge victory last week when Mexico's Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional for the federal government to criminalize the procedure. But the ruling's promise of expanding access to the procedure is still far from reality, says Maria Antonieta Alcalde, the Latin America and Caribbean director of the reproductive rights group IPAS. The point here is not capacity. The point here is political will. If you have the political will, organizations like IPAS can help the institutions to move forward and to, I mean, to, and to start offering the services I mean, as soon as possible. Last week's ruling will have limited impact on access until the federal public health system starts providing more extensive abortion services. Creo que sí estamos en un momento de Isabel Fulda, the deputy director of the reproductive rights group HIRE, said it was hard to estimate a time frame in which abortion would become universally accessible in Mexico. But the group stood ready to contest any federal resistance to provide services. What is needed is for Congress to do its job of revoking it as a crime. This is obligatory for them. It is not something they can freeze, postpone, or anything else. In fact, they have a deadline to do it. They must change the law. This is a great opportunity for them not only to modify the penal code, but also to introduce health modifications to the general health law. Just 12 of 32 Mexican states have removed abortion from their local penal codes. Proactively legalizing abortion at the federal level would offer legal protection to abortion patients in all states. How fast change is seen could come down to who is in power. President Andrés Manuel López Obrador has carefully avoided expressing his own views on abortion, whereas the two female candidates recently nominated to vie for his seat in the June 2024 election support abortion rights. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Turkey's Tomaf Caving Federation said that a researcher from the United States has been rescued from deep inside a cave in southern Turkey where he had become trapped after falling ill more than a week ago. Biden flew to Alaska to conclude a five-day trip to India and Vietnam and delivered remarks in a solemn ceremony in an anchorage where he vowed to never forget the 9-11 attacks. Venezuela President Nicolas Maduro arrived in Beijing to continue his state visit to China at the invitation of Chinese President Xi Jinping. Maduro is on a state visit to China. This is his fifth visit to China as president. Philippine Nobel laureate Maria Ressa and her new site Rappler were acquitted of tax fraud by a trial court in another legal victory for the embattled journalist and for press freedom in the Southeast Asian country. Thousands of Catalan independent supporters took to the streets of central Barcelona in a march to mark the Spanish region's national day, just as separatist parties take center stage in efforts to form a national government. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. We are leaving you tonight in New York as luxury designer Michael Kors uses escapism as inspiration for his spring-summer 2024 collection. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.